Now, what I feel today, I still to this day believe somebody who wants to build muscle or somebody who's been overtraining like I was doing huge amounts of training volume, for them, if they go on a high intensity routine like we're talking about, they will be shocked. Hello and welcome. I am Coach Castle, a certified biomechanics expert, nutritionist, and efficiency coach. Subscribe to this channel to learn the most efficient ways to maximize your muscle growth and recovery, enhance your body, and advance your mind, all using the latest science. Welcome to Castle's Corner. Hello and welcome to Castle's Corner. I'm Coach Castle, joined today by a very special guest, needs almost no introduction, Jerry Branium. Now, he was a competitive bodybuilder who trains alongside Frank Zane, Arnold, uh, Mike Menser, all the greats, the old champions. He began working out at the age of 11. He was introduced to his interest in nutrition by Bill Pearl at the age of 12, who gave him a book on it. He has been training for 54 years, unless I get that wrong. I think he started in 1962. He's been writing articles for 35 or 36 years, over 3,000 for all of the mainstream bodybuilding magazines. He has a wonderful website, AppliedMetabolics.com, where he also has a book you can download digitally, Natural Antibiotics, highly recommend it. I have a copy myself. He uh, has, I don't even know how many articles on there, but they're all absolutely amazing, scientifically accurate. They debunk all of the crazy gurus and people who don't know what they're talking about. And uh, I've had him join us today just because he's amazing. So welcome, Jerry. Thank you for joining us. We're happy to be here. By the way, the name is pronounced Brainum, just two syllables. Brainum. Brainum. Brainum, yeah, yeah. And as far as the training goes, I think it's something like 57 or 58 years at this point. Oh, wow. But, yeah, it's a long time, yeah. And as far as the articles, I, I, I lost count a while ago, but it's somewhere probably hoping around ni about 9,500. <laughs> so, uh, remember, I wrote for the uh, bodybuilding magazines for, for quite a few, for about 35 years. So I, I couldn't get a number. I couldn't find a number. <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, I, wrote, I was the science editor of muscle and fitness for 10 years. I was a, a, a editor at large for Flex magazine. And I wrote for uh, Iron Man magazine starting, I believe was 1986 until 2000, maybe 13, I think, or 14. Yeah, I, I wrote consistently the whole time. I also wrote over the years for various other maybe 12 or 13 other magazines, uh, briefly for muscular development, uh, all you know, international magazines. So I'm all over the place, basically. <laughs> I, I stopped buying a lot of those magazines forever ago. I think most of them, just because they're just full of nothing nowadays. But uh, I always would see your name pop up in them. <laughs> hey, listen, the magazines, I don't even know if they still exist, honestly. I mean, I don't even, I haven't looked at a bodybuilding magazine at least maybe 10 years, at least. Mm. But the last, the last couple of times I looked at them, I don't want to mention any names. I don't want to, you know, hurt anybody if they still exist, but they were terrible. I mean, you know, and I know why, because what happened is, uh, you know, with the advent of the internet, the, the advertisers, see, the, the lifeblood of magazines has always been the advertising, you know, for the supplements. What happened was the advertisers started stopping their, you know, it started decreasing their advertising in the bodybuilding magazines. Instead, they started putting them on the internet. And because of that, you know, the, the magazines lost a lot of money. So they've got to the point where they actually were not paying writers and photographers. So any articles that appear in the magazines were basically literal contributions. I mean, these people weren't getting paid. Some of them were like, let's say, trainers who thought by having their name in the magazine, it would help them get clients. So that was their motivation to do it. But I'm a professional writer, you know, and I, you know, without payment, I don't do it. So I was gone long before that. I was already gone from the magazines. But the point is that the quality, these people are not writers, and most of them don't have much knowledge. So the quality magazines, as you point out, went down to nothing. They're basically, I hate, the only way I can express it, I wouldn't use them to, to underline the, uh, a birdcage. Seriously, they're that bad. They're terrible. I, would, I mean, I would, they're just for selling things, and they're they're useless. They're for selling things. Yeah, they're completely useless. They're, they're, they're just seriously. If they still a lot, if they still exist, which I don't know, I heard some of them have, have gone into a digital format, 
they're still garbage. They're, they're a waste of time. You know, I, I would recommend them to anybody. That they're not. They are no longer good sources. They were once very good sources of information, but those days unfortunately are gone. Yeah. So, so what we have you on here for today, well, on limited time, unfortunately, I could pick your brain for probably weeks, so, <laughs> but uh, limited time. I'd like to talk a little bit about anti-aging, uh, nutrition for it, the hormones regarding it, what to do about it, and uh, maybe we'll get a little bit into bodybuilding too towards the end. Okay, sounds good. All right, so the first question I had for you is, would you mind speaking on the effects of hormones in regards to aging and how deteriorating hormones are bad for you, basically? Well, the thing is, for example, let's say, let's take testosterone as an example. You know, testosterone is a big thing now. They call it low T for a lot of men. It starts about age, it varies with individuals, but usually the testosterone levels start dropping around age 30 to 35 in men gradually. If I remember correctly, I, I believe it's uh, one to two percent a year that you start to get a testosterone drop. Now, the thing about testosterone is that not all men uh, get to the point of having testosterone low enough where they needed to be where they need to be supplemented, and a lot of it depends on the symptoms you're getting. There's a lot of symptoms associated with testosterone deficiency. For example, depression, low sex drive, uh, uh, increase of body fat. Uh, uh, there's a, a host of, uh, I can't even think of, uh, you know, erectile dysfunction. I could go on and on. If you're having these kind of problems, then you should, you know, look into, uh, uh, of course, there's uh, muscles. Uh, you can't leave that out. If you're working out with weights, if your testosterone gets too low, there's no progress whatsoever. And after a while, you won't even be able to maintain the little bit of muscle you have. I'm talking older men now. So under those conditions, it's good to have yourself tested to see if you're truly uh, testosterone deficient. Now, the problem in medicine is that the, uh, uh, the physicians, uh, first of all, there's the old uh, bugaboo, there's the old myth about testosterone causing prostate cancer. And the newer one is that it causes cardiovascular disease. And a lot of physicians who really don't know the, the medical literature about testosterone are very hesitant to give it to men even if they are medically or clinically testosterone deficient because of the fear of causing testosterone cancer. But there's a famous uh, uh, urologist from uh, Massachusetts, General Harvard. His name is Abraham Morgenthau. He, he was the first to show that the prostate gland has a finite ability to be affected by testosterone. In other words, anything more than normal levels of testosterone doesn't affect the prostate gland and does not cause cancer. He's shown this over and over again. Unfortunately, it, this hasn't been discovered or accepted by a lot of physicians who are still hesitant to give men testosterone. Now, on the other hand, you, uh, who are the men that usually need testosterone? A lot of times, believe it or not, a low testosterone level can be caused by having a lot of body fat, being out of shape, poor diet. That alone could Bring, especially if you're over 40, can give you a, a almost deficient level of testosterone. Many men who lose body fat, exercise and lose enough body fat, will find that their testosterone comes up to normal levels where they don't even require testosterone supplementation. So basically, uh, I, the, to sum it all up, I'd say the people that need testosterone, uh, I would say uh, most men, at least 50% of men over the age of 40 are on either low testosterone or borderline, borderline testosterone. Some the figures might even be higher than that, but you should really go by the symptoms. In other words, uh, if you're having uh, uh, all these like depression and, and loss of muscle, sexual problems, uh, that kind of thing, you should look into have yourself tested. If you, if you show low testosterone, maybe it'd be a good idea. But then again, uh, here's another problem is that the scale for testosterone is another controversy. Because in the scale of normal testosterone, I'm just going to give figures, it's, it goes anywhere from 300 up to 1,000, let's say. Anything, uh, you know, a three, anything below 300 is considered clinically deficient in testosterone. However, uh, some doctors believe that testosterone levels as low as 200 is normal, and they will, will, not, give, uh, they will not prescribe testosterone. Uh, a man who has a 300 level of testosterone uh, that's a, a debatable issue. Uh, I consider that testosterone deficient. In other words, uh, let's say a man, uh, uh, let's say 50, 60, you want to have mid-range 
normal. Uh, that, in other words, you want to have a testosterone at least, let's say, uh, anywhere between 500 to 800 would be considered okay for a guy, let's say, over 40, 50, 60 years old. Uh, to build muscle now, if you're in a category where, let's say you're a guy about 50, 55 years old, and you want to build, you, you're, you've been clinically diagnosed as uh, having low testosterone, if you want to build muscle, you're going to have to get a little bit slightly higher testosterone levels, around 800. You want to pr probably have between seven and 800 to build muscle at that age. Uh, the lower levels will maintain muscle, but make it difficult to build muscle. And the other controversy is the form of testosterone, because most doctors will give out uh, a, a testosterone cream. They used to give out a patch. I don't think they do that much anymore. The cream is designed to bring testosterone levels up to midpoint, around again, around four or 500. They believe that keeping it in within that physiological range will prevent any of, this, of the possible problems related to testosterone, such as prostate stimulation and the cardiovascular effect. They think having a high testosterone could cause increase your risk for these problems. Uh, that's again a, a debatable issue. The problem there is that having a four or five hundred testosterone will maintain muscle, but you're not going to build much muscle on that. You got to get it a little bit higher, and the only way to do that, unfortunately, well, not really unfortunately, is testosterone injections. Now, the problem with testosterone injections is twofold. First of all, you have to be able to give it to yourself. A lot of guys. And I've met these guys are afraid of needles. You know, they don't, yeah, yeah, they don't like, they don't like inject. I, I perfectly, listen, perfectly understandable. I had a perfectly phobia for, phobia for years, uh, even taking drugs for years. I still hate them. <laughs> that, that's, I wouldn't put you down for that. That's understandable. That's the first problem. In other words, but there's various sites. You can inject testosterone in your shoulder. You can inject it in the frontal thigh, or you can ingest it. You can in, inject it in the buttocks. I think the buttocks is probably the easiest place. It's a little hard to reach because you got to get the right area. You don't want to hit the sciatic nerve. You can have problems. You have to learn where to do it. And there's a lot of videos that show you exactly where to inject. Uh, they're pretty good. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, you know, you, you have to do that. Uh, the, and the other thing is that th there's a new thing in medicine. I can't remember this uh, doctor. You probably heard of him. You probably, he, he committed suicide not long ago. He, he, was, uh, he specialized in men's health, particularly testosterone replacement therapy. Can't remember his name. Oh, I know, I know who you're talking about. I know exactly where you're going with this, too. Yeah, I got to laugh out of this, of this lunatic. <laughs> he, he uh, no, actually, he advocated, he was the first I know to advocate sub Q testosterone. In mm -hmm. other words, and, and now, but he made a very silly statement. His reasoning, I saw this video, uh, the, the reasoning uh, was that. He said, when you, for example, he says, if you, if you start testosterone therapy, let's say at 40 years old, you have to stay on it. You know, it's not something you go on and off. You know, you stay on it because you're basically replacing deficient testosterone. So he says, after a while, you know, sticking those needles on your glute, you're creating little holes, you know, <laughs> and, and that's a problem. So he decided that the best way to, uh, to administer testosterone is through sub Q which involves much, much smaller doses of testosterone, anywhere from 50 to a maximum of 100 milligrams of, of testosterone. And you just inject it, you know, just like an insulin needle, inject it right, right under the skin. Now, uh, the, the advantages of that, if you look at some of these testosterone forums, uh, is that supposedly some of the problems with testosterone injections are you get an increase, for example, of dehydrotestosterone, which is a byproduct of testosterone. Uh, dehydrotestosterone is pr produced by the activity of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which converts testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. Let's call it DHT for short. Problem with DHT is associated with male pattern baldness, acne, and it used to be associated with prostate problems, including prostate cancer, but that, that, the newest research shows that's not true. So you can discount the prostate, but, but it still causes acne and it will stimulate. If you have the genetics of male pattern baldness, you're going to lose your hair with the high levels of DHT. So that I remember, I remember, I remember you saying in an interview, the reason you didn't do steroids and stayed natural was you wanted your beautiful head of hair, actually. Right. Actually, yeah, that's very true. Because when I was a teenager, when I was a teenager competing, uh, I contemplated using steroids because other teenagers my age 
we're using testosterone, we're using anabolic steroids. But then I noticed a pattern. These guys were like, what, how old was I? I was what, 20, 24 years old? These guys were going bald at 25, 26 years old. They were losing their hair. They had bald spots. And that's when I did the research and I found out about DHT. And I was, I, I come, as I said in the interviews, both of my grandfathers on both sides were bald as cue balls by the time they were 35. I have very bad genetics. My father never went bald, but my grandfathers did. And, you know, this recessive gene, I didn't want to take the chance because I didn't think I'd look good bald. So I, for that reason alone, I know it sounds funny. I avoided, I never took anabolic steroids. If I was it's just, important, I mean, if it's important to you, and I mean, a lot of steroids do actually have high contents of that. So, you you know. It, well, you know, the, well, the, the funny part is that, that, uh, that I wasn't even concerned about all the other possible side effects of steroids. In other words, all I was concerned about was the losing head. Now, the ironic part is, remember, this is many years ago. I could never have foretold that there'd be guys walking around completely bald. Every other guy I see is bald. You know, some of these guys actually have hair and shave their hair. I mean, every other guy I see is bald, and it seems to be completely accepted. When I was a, a young guy, women, you always told how they love guys with long hair. And, and I said, oh, my God, if I lose my hair, women will never look at me, blah, blah, blah. I'll never get married, this and that. You know, so I, I had a fear of it, you know, but I still, I mean, I don't regret the decision. Don't get me wrong, but getting back to the uh, testosterone therapy, the thing with the, again, with the injections is there, there's the possible thing is the increase in DHT with the DHT side effects. And, uh, and then there's the so-called cardiovascular effects. Uh, taking uh, testosterone supposedly will, you know, lower HDL and elevate LDL which sets you up in a pattern uh, that's risky for cardiovascular disease. However, what they, a lot of people don't realize is that when you take testosterone, uh, some of it, and this is another possible problem, uh, a certain percentage of it is converted to estrogen uh, by way of the aromatase enzyme. You know, and this is the way men produce estrogen. Every man produces estrogen in his body from his natural testosterone. Estrogen has certain health benefits in men. Uh, small amounts are needed for maximal health in men. However, you know, uh, the problem is that uh, if you get too much estrogen, there's a point where it starts to get dangerous. It's associated with sudden heart attacks and this and that. So that's another problem. Uh, however, with testosterone injections, because of the conversion into estrogen, uh, the HDL is not affected. See, it's not affected and LDL is not affected. So we can rule that out. However, a lot of doctors, when they administer testosterone injections, they're afraid of the estrogen because estrogen, there's some emerging research that shows that estrogen has a relationship with prostate cancer, stimulating it. Now, that's the irony. Testosterone doesn't stimulate, but estrogen may. It's not concrete yet, but it's an emerging science, let's say. So a lot of doctors are concerned about that. So that when they put a man on testosterone injection therapy, They'll also administer an anti-aromatase drug, such as Arimidex. The problem with that is the Arimidex is going to cut the estrogen down very low. And when that happens, now the normal testosterone injections is going to start to adversely affect blood lipids. We are going to get a drop in HDL, and you are going to get an increase in LDL, which theoretically, if you have a bad diet and not exercising, increases your risk for cardiovascular disease cardiovascular disease, CBD. However, if you're exercising and on a good diet, I would say it's not a big concern. I, it's not nothing to worry about. So another thing I wanted to mention, because I mean, again, I want to just make sure I'm not getting this mistaken, but something I say with my clients all the time, I'll have them do their blood work and then the doctor will you know, either prescribe them to or not. And quite frequently they'll tell them they don't want to put them on TRT, even though they're like 400, 500, they just say, oh, that's plenty healthy. And in my opinion, it's not. I mean, if somebody's trying to build muscle and lose weight and everything else at that age. You're correct. Uh, 400, 500, again, it'll, it'll, main, it'll prevent, it's enough to prevent the, the overt symptoms. Seize them. It, it, it's enough to prevent the overt symptoms of testosterone deficiency, the depression, the erectile, all that stuff. That amount will prevent the deficiency symptoms. But it, when you're talking about building muscle, that's another ball game. For that, you're correct. You have to have higher levels. I'd say, again, minimal 600, about 800 would be ideal. 
I'm talking for an older man. Now, the thing about testosterone uh, that you have to understand as long as it's kept within the normal range, which is 300 to 1,000, the body more or less accepts that as normal and nothing really bad happens. In other words, you're not going to get, uh, let's say, side effects, serious side effects from testosterone as long as it's kept within the normal range because it's more or less accepted by the body. See what I'm saying? Of course, you'll get things like it'll turn off your gonadotrophins, your luteinizing hormone. That'll be turned off. And that in turn can cause other side effects uh, that, that bother some guys. For example, when your luteinizing hormone is turned off by testosterone, because you know there's a feedback mechanism, your, your, your uh, brain, your hypothalamus, it can detect the amount of testosterone in your blood and it stops secreting a uh, gonadotropic releasing hormone, which in turn stops the release of luteinizing hormone from pituitary. The, the luteinizing hormone is what, what travels in the blood to the testes and stimulates testosterone synthesis. Without luteinizing hormone, this is the point, your testos, your testes shrink. In other words, you get the little, with the shrunken balls, to put it bluntly. And this bothers a lot of guys. Uh, the other concern is, let's say you're, uh, you're, you're diagnosed, uh, this is an unusual situation. Let's say you're only 32 years old, and for some reason you're diagnosed as low testosterone, but you wanna have children, right? Now you have to have, you know, to, to, have, to produce enough sperm you have to have a follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. You have to have both of them. But if you don't have enough testosterone, you can actually be infertile. So in other words, if you are, let's say, 32 years of age and you get on testosterone therapy, particularly the inject, injection, uh, or injectable version, you're going to turn off the luteinizing hormone. There's going to be a problem with infertility because after only one week, if you take a, uh, let's say, a 200 milligram injection of testosterone cypionate, in one week, your azoospermia, there's no sperm in one week, gone, stops. That's how fast it works, right? Now, there's a way to avoid that. The way to avoid that, and, and also to avoid the, 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 uh, the testicular atrophy, to use the medical term, rather than the idiomatic shrunken balls, uh, <laughs> so the, way, the way to prevent that is to take a, another uh, hormone called human, human gonadotropin, Human, gonadotro uh, human gonadotropic hormone, HGH, which uh, is uh, actually shows up in, you know, the women who take the pregnancy test, when they take the early pregnancy, what the, what the test is looking for is HCG, because that's an early sign of pregnancy. It's needed, it's one of the, it's needed to support pregnancy, especially in the early stages. But in men, the, the interesting thing is HCG is almost identical in structure to luteinizing hormone. Now it has to be injected because it's a peptide, but when you take HCG, small amounts, uh, you know, and I'm not talking about testosterone, uh, what is it called, post-cycle therapy. That's a whole, you know, with the bodybuilders that take huge amounts, they turn off the testosterone so much, it doesn't come back on when they get off the drugs. They have to take other drugs to turn it, and one of them is HCG, but this is a different situation. With this, you take very small amounts of HCG, no more than 250 micrograms, right? and you take it two days before your testosterone, let's say you're taking a weekly testosterone injection, let's say you're taking your testosterone injection on Friday. On Wednesday and Thursday, you would take an insulin needle, take 250 mic of micrograms of HCG, you can inject it, you know, just like insulin, the belly, very pain, it's a sub-Q injection, you, you don't get, feel anything, it's just a tiny little thing, it's very, very, uh, it's not like a regular needle, it's, it's almost nothing. That will actually not only maintain fertility as long as you're on testosterone, but it'll prevent your uh, testes from shrinking. So that's a, that's just a, a little tip for people that are worried about that. Now, this brings up a, a question I was going to ask you a little bit later, but now's a good time. Um, you said if you take your weekly testosterone shot. Now, this is what most um, testosterone doctors prescribe, the once a week shot. I Again, I don't like that. I like to split the dosage, uh, the same amount of the dose, but split between two days and a smaller dosage. Does that have any, imp any uh, impact? Yes, it does. Actually... That's one of the uh, uh, the principles behind the sub-Q injections because when you take the sub-Q, you're taking smaller amounts of testosterone, let's say 50 to 100 milligrams, but you're taking it three times a week. You're spacing it out. As such, you're getting a very steady level of testosterone. And also, you're also probably not going to get much conversion into estrogen. You're not going to stimulate the aromatase enzyme. You're also not going to get much conversion, if any, into DHT. It's probably a very safe way of doing it. But the key is, see, the, the thing about the, uh, the reason why doctors, another reason why doctors like to give the testosterone creams 
is because they take it every day and they maintain a steady, steady thing. It doesn't get very high, but it's steady. It doesn't drop, there's no drops. The problem with testosterone injections, let's say testosterone sipionate, is that it peaks in 48 to 72 hours, and then it starts a downward trend. Now, it still lasts in your blood, blood for as long as two weeks, but by the end of a week, it's, it's starting to drop pretty dramatically. So what you're talking about, taking it, let's say, bi-weekly or something like that, maybe smaller amounts, is, makes more sense physiologically, especially if you're concerned about these possible side effects like conversion into DHT and estrogen, it's better to do that. It will maintain, see the whole key is you wanna maintain a steady testosterone level. That's the key. And, and again, you, you, have, uh, you can either take the cream, which will keep you on the mid range, or you can take the injection, which will give you a little bit super physiological, but you could, you know, if you take it a little bit more, you know, let's say multi, you know, like more than once a week, it will probably will maintain it in a more physiological range. It's true. No, I, I'm a proponent of using insulin needles and injecting it, but not sub Q. I like to actually inject it the muscle. Uh, now, where I would be doing this would be the chest. Um, I mean, the delts, but that wouldn't really be an insulin needle. The glutes. I'm not a big fan of the quads uh, for multiple reasons, but I don't like the quads. I find doctors recommend them frequently. Uh, yeah, do you have any Do you have any thoughts on site enhancement or um, like actual engine receptors being affected? Uh, in direct correlation of where you're injecting? Uh, no, not really, not really. I, I, I can only tell you that uh, men, you know, the, 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 when you take, uh, uh, for example, when you take anabolic steroids, the old idea was that when you took huge doses of anabolic steroids, your androgen receptors would shut down. They would go, they'd be downregulated. And then because of that, the steroids wouldn't work after a while, right? But now they know that your body adjusts Newer, newer studies showed that when you take, let's say, testosterone or anabolic steroids, new androgen receptors open to accept the extra hormone that you're taking. See what I'm saying? So, but I, I don't think that, you know, because the androgen receptors, are, there's no such thing as directly stimulating, you know, let's say shooting in the shoulder will stimulate the androgen receptors there. It will, it will but it'll stimulate everywhere. And just as a bit of curiosity, in men, the largest amount of androgen receptors are in the trapezius muscle of all, of all places. That's why the trapezius muscle is really easy for almost anyone, is very easy to grow. Or you, if you do show, a guy who can't grow anywhere, if he does some shoulder shrugs, he'll start to get traps. Well, as long as he doesn't do the, the head bobs, you know, the guys like yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's another thing. I see guys in the gym going like this. It's a, that's another story. You know? I ask him what the hell they're doing. Like, you realize you're not actually moving your shoulders, right? And you're yeah. not even going towards the origin of the muscle. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, you lost a sheet, Gary. You lost a yeah. sheet. Hold on, hold on a second. Pick that up. Hold on. Wait. I'll blame Bruno for that. Don't worry. There we go. Let's get back to you, back to being a floating head. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Uh, what were we saying again? Go ahead. Oh, God, I don't remember. Uh, something about traps and people being oh, yeah, yeah. About the, yeah. <laughs> how they not even doing good form. It's ridiculous. I mean, I trained at Gold's Gym in Venice, and uh, I would say 99% of the people there have no idea how to train at all, nothing. I mean, every exercise they do is completely wrong. Short movements, they don't know what the hell they're doing. It's atrocious. I've never it's, seen it. It's all based on ego. I mean, I have a whole series on YouTube, ego lifting versus biomechanics, where I just break down the common things and, and why people yeah. just do them because it makes it look strong, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a lot of it's just ignorance. They just don't bother to check. They don't look at stuff like Dig, Doug's stuff, Doug's uh, Brignoli. They don't even bother to look at the YouTube videos. Some of them do are pretty good as far as, you know, showing how to train properly using proper form. They don't bother to look at it. And they basically come up with their own exercises. I mean, I see people doing that. I have no idea they'll, they'll take a dumbbell, they'll, they'll this, this kind of, what the hell are they doing, you know? Well, uh, you know. I, I, I never know how to judge people. It just, it just seems like they don't want to know, almost. It just seems like it's easier to invent their reasons and then come up with reasons why it doesn't work. Right. But you see, the problem there is that there's no progress. They never make any gains. In other words, fat guys stay fat, skinny guys stay skinny. There's, 
no, for crying out loud. Hold on, let me disconnect this for a while. <laughs> well done. No worries. Go ahead. Anyway, in other words, when you the problem with training like that, there's no progress. I mm -hmm. mean, if you just want to go in the gym and, and uh, go through the motions, that's fine. But if you're there for a reason, if you have any particular goal, you're not going to get anywhere training in that manner. Let me pick up Bruno because he's going to start parking and get all right. Anyway, uh, and the other thing, of course, uh, it really pisses me off is this cell phone thing. I mean, uh, uh, when I go to Gold's Gym, and I'm not exaggerating, maybe me and one other guy are the only people in the gym that are not walking around with cell phones. And they sit on the machines and they play with their cell phones. And, it, you know, it's one thing if you don't get me wrong, let's say you have something important uh, pending, your wife is about to give birth, or you have a parent in the hospital, something. And you need to have be contacted. And then you can carry the cell phone. But I see what these people are doing. They're on Facebook, Instagram, stupid TikTok, that kind of stuff. They sit there for 20 minutes. They'll do I mean, a I mean uh, what, what are they there for? What are they I, there for? I have no idea. The thing is, too, I mean, I'm, as an efficiency coach, something I speak about is gym efficiency. And people do their workouts at home in most cases. I mean, my, my entire gym is at my house. I have a lot of gyms where I train people at, obviously. But I work out at home. And I don't yeah. need to. I got 200 pounds of weights and cable systems. I'm fine. Most people work out at home because they don't want to deal with the gyms. But even if you go to the gym, if you're there for more than 35 minutes or 40 minutes, you're, I don't know what you're doing. You're, there's no intensity. There's no focus. You're not training properly. You no, know, I, I don't see any intensity. Zero, zero in this gym. Zero. They don't, I, they, I mean, it was not like the old days back in, you know, I go back to the original Gold's gym. I mean, I'm not going to say everybody there who knew how to knew how to train, but I I didn't see the extent of this poor training style that I see that I see today. I mean, everybody knew how to do basic curls and bench press, whatever they knew. With uh, today, they can't even do a bench press for crying out loud. Nothing. These people are are. Uh, I just try to keep focused on my own workout. I don't even look at these people because, uh, you know, I I zoom through the workout. I I I you know I try to get in and out as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't engage in conversation, you know, I, uh, unless it's somebody I know, I'll say hello, goodbye, that's it. I don't, I don't get into, you know, I mean, you're, you're either there, I mean, what are you doing? You're wasting it. You might as well stay home and watch Netflix. Why are they going to the gym? They're not getting any cardiovascular benefit. They're not doing anything. It's not doing I, anything. I have, I have no idea. I've, I've been going to these same gyms training people for years. I see these, these I know, personal trainers, I hate even calling them that, but they'll have clients for years with no results. I'll have clients just because they're doing the latest fad things and using the latest yeah. gadgets and, and talking right, right. more than training and the trainers are on their phones. And, right. Uh, I've seen that too. I mean, uh, why would, this is, I mean, common sense, why would you pay a trainer year after year if you're not showing any progress at all? I don't get it. What goes these are Well, I don't know if you even know this, but trainers no longer track progress. I, I, I don't know how you can train somebody without taking their measurements and tracking their diet, food, and weight, but apparently they, they see no reason to track any form of progress. I didn't know that. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah, I I've, I've I mentioned could, all... Sorry. I, I, I was just going to say, I could see it visually, however. Because like I say, these people never change. Men and women, not just men, men and women. They I have so many... I have so many clients that come to me, they have these, these weird cookie cutter programs, no mention of diet. I, I mentioned their body measurements. What are your measurements? I have no idea. What do you, yeah. How do you know you're making progress? Oh, my trainer told me so. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, get, getting back to what, what, what were we- Yeah, yeah, so we got to sidetrack yeah. there, but uh, <laughs> let's talk yeah. about keto. So this is a huge yeah. thing. I don't know where this originated from, Dr. Oz or somebody, but every single, let's say, person or wannabe bodybuilder or something seems to think keto is the solution. I've had clients who were on keto for four or five years. Um, yeah, I know, yes. And uh, one in particular is very, very disturbed that I said you should not be on keto for four or five years. You need to start eating some carbs and doing some other things. Uh, would you just mind talking on keto for a minute? Sure, not at all. Well, here's my feeling about keto. I have to admit, I, when I was a bodybuilding competitor, I, I tried many, many diets. As I've written in Applied Metabolics, I tried every diet known to man, you name it. Fad diets, low calorie, low fat, high carb. And you know, none of them ever worked for me until I came across low carb diets. And I, I actually used a ketogenic, I, I eventually settled on a system where when I was training for a contest, I'd start with a ketogenic diet. And a lot of people don't know the ketogenic, the, the, key, the uh, 
ketones, which are the core of the keto dinner those are the greater production of, uh, of ketones, which is a signal that you're actually oxidizing fat to a greater extent. It takes a while. There's something called keto adaptation that takes anywhere from five to up to seven weeks. That's why a lot of these studies that compared, let's say, ketogenic diets to, let's say, low-fat, high-carb diets showed that the low-fat, higher-carb diets actually led to greater fat loss because the, the amount of fat that they had on these diets was abnormally low, 7% fat. Who eats a seven? Eat, even vegetarians eat more fat than that. What and did if, they have them eating? I, I don't know. I, I couldn't <laughs> tell you offhand, but I remember it was 7% 7, 7 fat. And you know, they last for like three weeks. And then they, the conclusion was uh, the low fat, uh, uh, the high carb diet uh, led, led to greater fat uh, but, uh, you know, loss than the keto. But there was a proviso. What they found, though, was that the ketogenic diet, the, the amount of fat, uh, let's say the fat oxidation occurred faster with the ketogenic diet. But by the end of three weeks, supposedly it, the, the uh, lower fat diet was superior. And then they concluded that the low fat diet was superior to ketogenic. Now, the problem with the ketogenic diet is a, a, a number of problems. First of all, from the vantage of, uh, I just will say this though, for burning fat, it's fantastic. I don't think there's anything better. In fact, I wrote an article in, in uh, uh, Applied Metabolics. It was called the 5% Fat Diet. It was based on a, uh, I talked about a book that was written by Dan Duchesne. I don't know if you ever heard of Dan Duchesne. He was, maybe, called, the, maybe. He was called the steroid guru. He's very famous years ago uh, as, a, as a, he was a self-taught uh, expert on a couple of things. But anyway, he wrote this book on how to attain extremely low body fat and basically involved a ketogenic diet. Maro D. Pasquale, who was an MD out of Canada, he wrote a book called The Anabolic Diet, very similar. Again, starts out with low carb diet. And it's excellent. There's nothing better for burning fat. But the problem is that the long-term effects, especially if you want to build muscle, it's not good. It's not good. It will limit the amount of muscle because, for example, uh, without if you stay on a ketogenic diet, your levels of IGF-1 start to drop. Insulin-like growth factor. It's an, it's an important anabolic hormone, especially the intramuscular IGF-1. That, that's, that's probably the most anabolic of all hormones the one that's produced directly in the muscle because it stimulates the differentiation of what they call satellite cells, which are muscle stem cells needed to, to, for muscle hypertrophy or growth. And it does a, a number of other things. Uh, it would take a long time to go into all the details, but let's just say that the way I uh, character, characterize a ketogenic diet, good for short term, not to stand all the time. Now myself, when I went on the ketogenic diet, I stayed on it for about six weeks to get the fat you know, burning uh, kick started, so to speak, and it worked. I started by the end of six weeks, I was losing a lot of fat. By that point, I started to gradually. This is what Dr. Atkins of the famous Atkins diet, low carb, this is what he advised. A a after a couple of weeks, you start gradually adding good carbs, like, you know, fruits and vegetables, fiber of carb, carbs that contain fiber. You start adding them back to the diet. For contests, I had to limit myself for experimentation. I found I couldn't take more than five, uh, I'm sorry, 150 grams of carbs to continue, continue the fat loss. Some guys could take a lot more than that. But the point is that ketogenic diet, uh, is, it's not good for uh, uh, year round. It causes uh, other possible health effects. It, 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 in other words, you have to have, you know, it, it's, it's kind of ironic because see, the funny thing is that, you know, there's no dietary requirement for carbohydrates. See, that's the thing. There's no dietary, contrary to what you see all over the web and articles, you have to have this amount of carbs, that. There is no dietary requirement. You do not, humans do not need to eat carbohydrate. The reason why is the body has other ways. The ketones I mentioned, for example, ketones are alternative fuel sources that can be used in the place of glucose, especially in the brain. Ketones are actually used by the brain more efficiently as fuel than glucose itself. Uh, ketones can be used by you, most body tissues, not all, it can't be used by the eye and certain uh, the parts of the nervous system. But then you have, for example, you have what they call gluconeogenesis, which is where if your body is uh, uh, low in glycogen or you know, your, your, your nervous system does need a certain amount of glucose, a minimal amount, your body can convert other substances. For example, amino acids can be converted in the liver into glucose. This is gluconeogenesis. 
so could la so can lactate that you produce when you work out. That's a kind of a fatigue byproduct, if you want to call it that. And, and, and then you have 10% of fat is glycerol. Glycerol can also be converted into glucose. For these reasons, you don't need to have any carbohydrate. In fact, there was a study, I remember I wrote about it, where they had guys lift weights, two groups. One lifted weights and had carbs after the workout. And when you have carbs after the workout, it goes right to replenishing glycogen. Because what they discovered, this is very recent. They didn't know this. This is like, like within the last six months, they used to think when you worked out with weights, that three set, let's say you do three sets of curls, you burn between 24 and 48% of the glycogen content of that muscle, let's say the bicep muscle. They now know that it, it's a, that glycogen is stored in different compartments within the muscle. And the net effect is you burn more glycogen than was previously believed. So, so when you take in carbohydrates, let's say right after the workout, the body has a hierarchy. It takes those carbs and immediately sets them aside to repl replenish the glycogen that you used, right? But uh, as far as, uh, 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 anyway, getting back to the study. So one group had carbohydrates. At the, you guys lifted weights. One, one of the group had some carbohydrates. The other had no carbohydrates. And the hypothesis of the study was the group that worked out, exhausted some of their glycogen and didn't have carbs they would be glycogen depleted, right? Now they said, because they're not eating carbs, how are they gonna replace? They weren't. They, they had as much glycogen replenishment as the others. It turns out the lactate that they produced during the workout was converted in the liver into glucose, went to the muscle and replaced the glycogen. The, the, enzyme, the enzyme converted into, in the muscle, convert, uh, glycogen synthase converted into uh, uh, glycogen. So. In other words, my point of that story is that it shows that there is literally no need for carbohydrates. So you could say, well, if that's true, then what's the problem with the ketogenic diet? I mean, why couldn't you stay on no carbohydrates? Well, a lot of it has to do with a certain other effects it has in the body besides the carbohydrates. It's a long story, but to make a long story short, uh, again, I believe it's good for short-term, let's say kick-starting fat loss, but after a while, you want to add, again, it depends on the individual. Some individuals uh, can, can consume a lot more carbohydrates than others. I remember talking to Jake Cutler, who won the Mr. Olympia four times. He told me that he can't train hard unless he has 1,000 grams of carbohydrates a day. He says anything less than that, he can't train hard. Now, I thought back to my days of trial. When I, I said, if I had 1,000 grams of carbohydrates when I was training for a contest, I would have looked like the Pil Pillsbury Doughboy. I, I would have not lost any fat at all. And a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with insulin sensitivity. The more insulin insensitive you are, the more the more sensitive you are to carbohydrates. Those are the people that have to be careful about carbohydrate intake. Uh, the, an estimated 75% of people walking around are, are probably insulin insensitive for a number of reasons. Could be because of uh, high body fat levels. Uh, poor diet. There's a lot of reasons to explain it, but those people have to really watch the carbs. Again, if you're not in, so the other 25%, you can have practically unlimited carbs and you will not get fat from them. I mean, I ha I've had problems with some of these so-called experts, these people with the doctorates who write, they quote textbook, uh, textbooks that say, you, you, you're, you cannot gain body fat from eating any amount of carbohydrates. In other words, you're, 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 it's impossible. You cannot get fat from carbohydrates because the excess carbohydrates are oxidized in the liver. This is what they say, right? Now, I know from my personal experience and literally hundreds of others who I've observed, you probably have to, the, the notion that you can eat any amount of carbohydrates and not get fat is so ridiculous, so stupid, that yet they keep, they keep arguing. They, they, you know, they have big fights with the ketogenic guys who claim, you know, who say what I said about the carbide. Oh, no, 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 the, the body burns up carbide. You can't get, that's nonsense. It's nonsense. What is there, what is there I, I haven't heard that actually. What is their explanation for getting fat? Uh, dietary fat. Fat, what? fat, yeah. In other words, <laughs> you get fat from uh, two things, two things. I'm sorry, I have to be complete. According to these guys, what makes you fat are two things. Excess calories in general, which is true and excess fat. The second thing I have a problem with. Now they go by the fact that fat doesn't require as much calories to metabolize 
as, for example, carbohydrates and, and protein. And uh, they, they, they go that they say there's no de, de novo fat synthesis, meaning that the liver doesn't produce fat from excess carbohydrates, you know, blah, blah. This is what the uh, uh, textbooks say. But fat uh, you could, has a more or less direct expression, excess fat has a direct express route into fat cells. In other words, the body will take, if you eat excess fat, it'll shuttle the fat directly into fat cells. There's your fat. And especially if you eat uh, uh, excess calories, the bottom line though, is they say excess calories more than anything else accounts for body fat more than anything else. That's just, I mean, it's like a crappy argument. Of course, excess calories, you know, but why would you relate that to fat? We know how stored fat and carbs are stored, you know, like. Well, you want to see something interesting? I, I, I don't think it's come out yet. And maybe it has, I don't even remember. I wrote an article. I came across a, uh, a, a study. It was a case study. It was only one guy. He actually wrote it up himself. It was in a medical journal. He, 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 he went on an overeating program. He, you know, he was an average guy who only weighed about 160 pounds, right? He decided to ingest 5,600 calories, which was way too much for him. But there was a difference. The amount of calories on both diets, he used two diets. The amount of calories on both diets was exactly the same. They called it isocaloric. There was one difference though. One of the diets was a ketogenic diet where the calories from carbohydrates were replaced by fat. The other diet, of course, you know, contained you know fat and carbohydrates in this and that. Well, it turns out that on the regular 5,600 uh, 5, calorie diet that included carbohydrates and fat, he put on uh, I think it was three or four pounds of fat, if I, if I remember correctly. On the diet that contained the same number of calories but didn't came, contain any carbohydrates, he lost four pounds of fat on the same amount of calories. Now, which was he trying to prove, though? He was. Uh, he 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 really wasn't sure. He wasn't. He wanted oh. to see. He wanted to see how macronutrients uh, affect weight gain, even if you take in the same exact number of calories. But he wasn't on a weight loss diet. He was on a weight gain diet. He didn't expect to lose weight on the low. Let's say the, the ketogenic uh, fifty six hundred calorie diet, and he was eating huge amounts of fat. Now think about it. According to these academics, let's say I'll call them, eating he was eating something like 70, 80 percent fat to get that many calories. Now, 5,600 calories, mostly fat. According to them, he should have blown up like a house, and yet he lost four pounds. Now, how do they explain that? How do they explain that? In other words, they say calories are everything. Why didn't he lose? Why? How did he lose fat? And why did he gain fat on the other one? I hate that argument that a calorie is a calorie. And I really hope he did the keto one second, uh, come to think of it. Well, I'm not sure how the, the sequence, but uh, that's what it came out to. And, you know, he didn't have much of an explanation himself. I mean, he really couldn't. He, he said something about he used expression like thermogenesis and this and that. But, you know, calories do count. But to say they're everything is you have to kind of like modify that statement. Calories, uh, in other words, to say that fat calories will always make you fat, and it, it, it's not true. It's simply not true. I know this for myself because when I went on, again, the ketogenic diets, in the absence of carbohydrates, I ate a pretty, I don't think I ate 80% fat, but I ate, uh, consumed at least 60 to 70% fat on those diets, and yet I lost tremendous amounts of fat. According to them, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have lost any fat. Why was I, I, I lose four inches off my waist in five weeks. According to them, I should, I should have been gaining fat, fat on my waist. I mean, after all, fat calories, right? Or, you know, so calories, calories are important. I'm not going to say they're not important, but to, to say that the be all end all of everything, uh, you know, is, is not, is not really true, you know. I mean, they affect your hormones in a completely different way anyway. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a big one too. I mean, let, let's say, for example, like Mike Manser, you've ever heard Mike Manser? Oh, I'm a Mike, big proponent of high intensity, actually. And then, you know, Mike used to, I think he's written his, uh, written this. He used to talk about how if he went on an all ice cream diet, ate nothing but sugar ice cream, not diet ice cream, sugar ice cream, that as long as his calories were below his, his, his uh, physical activity needs, he would still lose body fat, right? Yes and no. My answer to that is yes and no. It depends on the person. If you do that, with a person who's in who's highly insulin insensitive, that amount of sugar is going to kick out so much insulin. You have to understand what's the function of insulin. 
not just to ferry glucose into cells, but it also helped, it's also a uh, storage hormone. It helps to store fat, it helps to store protein, and it helps to store carbohydrates as glycogen. And when insulin is high, fat in the body is either being synthesized or stored. So the thing is, you might, on, on Mike's, let's say, low calorie ice cream diet, you might not get fatter, right? But you're not gonna lose much fat if, if you're insulin sensitive, because you're kicking out so much insulin, that insulin's gonna maintain the, the, uh, the, the, fat, the fat cells. So you're not gonna, you're gonna lose surprisingly little amounts of fat. And with the insulin sensitivity, I mean, a huge factor in that is, is muscle mass. I mean, uh, I think, gen I'm not sure the role genetics have to play in that, but I'm sure they play a big role as well um, yeah. with insulin sensitivity. But I know I myself was was pretty bad at one time and I had to diet pretty strict to fix my, my insulin sensitivity. I mean, it's putting muscle on, of course, as you know, helps, you know. But uh, what, what would you say, if we could wrap it up, what would you say would be a good diet, something simple you could recommend for longevity? I mean, I know the Mediterranean is a great option. Uh, I've heard you speak about different blue zones. Could you maybe summarize that? Well, yeah, basically the blue zones about, if, I forget this, I forget how many blue zones there are. You know, these are areas around the world where oh, there's five of them, okay. Five, I think, yeah. They have a commonality where they tend to uh, eat some kind of Mediterranean style diets. And to answer your question, for longevity and for all around health and maintaining low body fat levels, I believe a Mediterranean style diet is the best diet because of the fact that it contains a lot of, uh, first of all, it doesn't contain a lot of, uh, of uh, let's say bad nutritional elements. Uh, it, it focuses on fruits, vegetables, certain amount of meat, uh, you know, it allows protein foods. The protein can be adjusted for, let's say if you're a bodybuilder and athlete, you can raise the protein. But the key to, the, the, uh, to success, the reason why the Mediterranean diet, I think is one of the best diets for longevity is because of the ox antioxidant and polyphenol content. For example, you have stuff like extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil has elements in it that are tremendous. I mean, that are found only in the olive oil. I just came across, I just did an article for Applied Metabolics about thyroid metabolism. And I, 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 there's a new study that came out, olive oil, can actually normalize thyroid function. It can actually help, you know, if you have low thyroid, it can actually help normalize thyroid. So could other natural substances like ashwagandha herb, there's other things. But the point being that uh, uh, the, let's say extra virgin olive oil, uh, it's, it's mostly monounsaturated fats, which is fairly healthy fat. It's not an essential fat, but the main monounsaturated fat found in extra virgin olive oil called oleic acid stimulates a substance called sirtuin-1 or CERT-1, which is a cell protector associated with longevity. The reason why calorie restricted diets uh, extend life that is thought, because, uh, thought to work because it stimulates CERT-1. And oleic acid is a very potent CERT-1 stimulator. And this is one of the keys to the Mediterranean diet. Also, you know, the fact is they eat a number of things that contain things like polyphenols, antioxidants. The net effect is that the elements, the nutritional elements contained in the Mediterranean diet prevent the two biggest killers. Cardiovascular disease is one, cancer is the second. In other words, it helps to prevent these things. And you also can't discount the higher fiber content. Fiber is extremely important. I, I've done articles on fiber. I'm going to do another one for applied metabolic because I think it's extremely overlooked. Uh, and it, there's a new dimension of fiber that didn't exist years ago. This relates to what they call the intestinal microbiome. I'm sure you've probably heard of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the research, I, I keep trying to write an article on the microbiome for play, but there's so much research that I can't even begin to write it. it the article would be about 500 pages long because it's burgeoning. The research comes out every day there's something new about it. To make a long story short, the intestinal microbiome is, microbiome is absolutely essential to health. 99% of your immune system is in communication with the microbiome. It affects everything, digestion of fat, digestion of carbohydrates, body fat loss, muscle gain. The, and the, the way to keep your intestinal microbiome healthy is to avoid refined carbohydrates, junk fat, and also to eat plenty of fiber. Fiber is the food for the intestinal microbiome. If you don't eat enough fiber, you're going to get something called dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of the uh, 
organisms that exist in the uh, microbiome, which is in the colon, by the way. Uh, and, you, and that will lead to a lot of health problems, a lot of health problems. So you can't overlook a fiber and the Mediterranean diet. That's one of the key features. It has a lot of fiber. That's an important aspect. Now, when it comes to fiber, I know a lot of people aren't too crazy about eating it. Would you mind recommending a particular supplement of fiber? Is there a best kind per se, or would you recommend fruits and vegetables? Fruits and vegetables are, are your best option because they're natural and, and this and that. But if you don't want to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and you, you, you still want to get uh, at least 30 grams of fiber is the minimum uh, recommended amount. I personally think 60 grams and up is more optimal. There is a side effect. I'll talk about that in a second. But well, the first one is gas. You're going to get gas because again, fiber is indigestible carbohydrate. You and you know your your when your bacteria work on them, they kind of produce gas. So you get gas. You know, there's flatulence and all that stuff. Uh, but the thing about uh, the supplemental fiber, what I recommend is something called psyllium, psyllium seed, uh, and there's also uh, something called hydrolyzed guar gum. Guar gum is found naturally in beans. Beans are healthy because they contain soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is the type of fiber that will lower your excess blood levels like cholesterol, help to prevent cardiovascular disease, right? Uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, uh, another one is, I think they sell something called apple fiber, which contains pectin, which is another soluble fiber, very, very good. I myself take supplemental fiber because quite frankly, for two reasons, to feed my intestinal microbiome, Second, I don't eat a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. It's just, I just don't have a taste for them. So I take uh, what I, every day I mix, I take two tablespoons of psyllium seed powder. I take uh, a tablespoon of apple fiber. And I take, uh, what is it? I take a, a scoop of, a, of a hydrolyzed guar gum. That combination gives me something like 35 grams of fiber in one shot. Now I've been using this for years. If, you, if uh, somebody tried to duplicate what I do right off the bat, they're going to get tremendous flatulence. So they're going to be farting all over the place. So you, you have to, your body has to get used to it. The, 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 uh, the, the bad negative effect about a high fiber diet is that you're going to be going to the bathroom a lot. You know, you know I mean, uh, it, it, a high fiber diets, I mean, the, the people who, uh, who was in, uh, in Africa, I remember reading uh, the, the indigenous people were eating huge amounts of fiber, 100 to 150 grams a day. They uh, had to go to the defecated 15 times, up to 15 times a day or more. So you're going to go. Yeah. So that's the bad part. You're going to be going to the toilet a lot. You know, if you eat a well, lot. Well, I mean, in your case, in my case, you know, we can write articles and do research while we're in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me though, that, you know, in my mind, I mean, that's a that's a small price to pay. That's only going to happen if you eat more than let's say 70 grams a day of fiber. If you eat like uh, up to 50 grams, you're not, it's just going to be normal. You're not going to have any real problem. But I mean, that to me, you know, is a small price to pay if, I, if it's helping my, the intestinal microbiome, because that is so important. That is, oh my God, that I can't even put into words how important that is. I mean, in this era of COVID-19 where everybody's worried about their immune system, I mean, I, say, I hear people say, oh, I'm not going to get the COVID vaccination because I have good immunity. Well, I got news for you, buddy. If you're not eating fiber, you don't have good immunity. You know, you don't. You might think you do, but you don't. And if you do get exposed to it, I'll leave the sentence on a, a, a little bit hanging in the air. You know what happens there. You know, but in other words, if you really want to help your immune system, you have to have fiber. It's very, very important. It's very overlooked. I mean, it's at this point, I'm going to actually plug you again and just recommend everybody, please subscribe to applymetabolics.com. It's a great, great resource. Really, and um, this on, on the next subject of supplementation, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm an online coach, but I'm in Florida currently, and I do have a lot of clients in person as well. And I, I get this all the time. I don't know if you've had to deal with it, but I don't like pills, and I have to try to explain that you really need to supplement and that they're critical. Would you mind speaking on supplementation and maybe recommending a short list for health and longevity? Well, the supplementation, I always, when I talk about supplements, I've always keyed in on the word supplements. Supplements are to supplement what you're not getting in your diet. If you speak to the average physician, who, by the way, knows, uh, average physician knows zilch about nutrition. There's no training in medical school for nutrition. Uh -huh. they, they can recognize certain nutritional deficiencies like berry, berry, thymine, or maybe a riboflavin. 
but they don't know anything about the nuances, let's say, of nutrition. And the thing about, uh, the thing is that if you ask the, uh, let's say a, a person goes to their doctor and says, uh, doctor, uh, what uh, vitamin supplements do you think I should take? The doctor will say, forget supplements. They, they're, they're all snake oil. Eat a balanced diet. And, you know, the, the, the problem is that most people don't eat a balanced diet. When I used to give nutrition seminars, I always started the seminar, I'd ask a question to the audience. With a raise of hands, how many people eat a balanced diet? And when I'd ask that, half the room would raise their hands. Then I'd start going through what constitutes a balanced diet, dairy foods, meats, uh, you know, vegetables, fruit, blah, blah, seafood. With each passing one, the less and less hands would go up. By the time I got to the dairy foods, and a lot of people don't like to eat, drink milk or eat cheese or this kind of stuff, there was like one or two hands raised, uh, you know, before they had almost the whole room. So, you know, my point being, most people who think they follow a balanced diet don't. As a consequence, they will be lacking certain, uh, there's no question, they'll be lacking certain nutrients. It's going to catch up with them. And then there's the problem that certain nutrients are very, very difficult to get in food. Two that come to mind are vitamin E. The, uh, you know, the, the requirement for vitamin E is tiny. It's like 15 units, but 15 units won't give you the health benefits. It's kind of like testosterone. You won't get any, all, all it will do is prevent an overt vitamin E deficiency. To get the health benefits of vitamin E, such as cardiovascular protection, you have to take minimal 400 units and it has to be mixed to copperols, also including tocotrienols, because vitamin E is a general term. It actually consists of eight different substances, four tocopherols and four tocotrienols. For maximum health benefits, you have to have all of them, right? So uh, the other one, of course, is vitamin D. My God, where do you get vitamin D? It's free. You get it from the sun. Problem. The sun has to be in the right place in the sky to get the right spectrum of ultraviolet rays. The ultraviolet rays react with the cholesterol in your skin. It's converted by enzymes into vitamin D. If the, if the uh, UV spectrum is, in other, words, in other words, if the sun is not in the right place in the sky, like in the winter in, in northern latitudes, you can walk around naked and you're not going to get any vitamin D production because you're not getting the UV spectrum. If you have darker skin, you're not going to get enough vitamin D from the skin. If you're obese or have high body fat levels, the vitamin D that's produced is going to be sequestered in the fat and you're still not going to have optimal vitamin D levels. If you're an older person over, let's say 50, the ability to convert cholesterol in the skin into vitamin D from ultraviolet declines. You can also have vitamin D. What am I saying? I'm saying that most people should take a vitamin D supplement. Relating to what you say, they, they might, somebody might say, well, I don't want to take those pills. You got to look at what a vitamin D pill looks like. I take a vitamin D pill. Each one contains 2,400 units. It's a little gelatin pill. You know how small it is? It's so small that if I drop it on the floor, I can't find it. That's how small it is. This could be swallowed by an infant with no problem. A newborn baby could swallow a vitamin D capsule. And it goes a long way because it turns out vitamin D is involved in over 1,000 genes in the body. Vitamin D receptors are everywhere. The brain, the muscles, you name it. Without vitamin D, you have increased chance of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, you name it. Now to answer your question about swallowing the pills, uh, you know, that, that, that's some, some problem. Some people don't like to swallow pills, it's true but they either will have to kind of like get used to it or, you know, it, I, I don't think it's that a great an idea, but if you want to, you could chop up the pills and mix them in a drink if you have to take it that way. There are some liquid vitamin formulas. They're not very good though. Most of them don't have enough potency uh, to be of any good. But I mean, if you're lacking these vitamins or minerals, uh, a lot of, for example, if you don't eat dairy foods, where are you going to get your calcium from? Uh, the, the, the vegetarians will, if there was one city, well, you get them from your vegetables, you're lying. Uh, yeah, calcium's in vegetables, but you also have, I, I wrote an article on this in uh, Applied Metabolics, uh, it's about anti-nutrients. These are the natural substances found in foods that basically lock on to other, to uh, nutrients and prevent them from being absorbed. In the case of vegetables, you have something called oxalate. Oxalate, like spinach, is high in calcium, but it's loaded with oxalate. 